Hi, I'm Art Bergeron and welcome to seminar number five uh, of my uh, series Elder Law 101, which I'm doing all this year. Um, this is really uh, part of really a comprehensive series to allow you to understand all the issues that you might want to need to know about uh, if you're a senior. Uh, so we started off with, with my, I always talking about my friends Frank and Mary, whom we're going to talk about a little bit more. We started off uh, initially talking about incapacity and estate planning before 60, because some issues do occur before you get to be 60. Uh, then we started talking in seminar two about uh, issues during your 60s when you're um, re thinking of retiring, you're thinking about Social Security and Medicare, uh, you're starting to deal with, with tax deferred issues. And then in seminar number three, we talked about your 70s, um, where you're maybe thinking about moving and changing your, 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 your situation. Um, we, we took in, in, uh, in seminar number four, which was in April, we talked about taxes and how those specifically impact seniors. Um, this month, we're going to talk about life in your 80s. Uh, and once again, as a brief preview, um, after that, next month, we're going to talk about why it is that even if you have not done advanced planning, you can always qualify for mass health. And this is what a lot of people come to me to talk about. And so I really want to kind of um, explain how that works and explain why you can always qualify. Um, the following month, I'm going to talk about um, the last year of your life, dealing with a whole bunch of things uh, during the point that you're in decline. Uh, then we're going to talk about what happens after you're dead. We're going to talk, first of all, about postmortem planning in general, in terms of dealing with probate or dealing with assets that don't go through probate, we're going to do a, se a, second, a second seminar specifically talking about trust administration um, following your death because so many people, as part of their estate plans, have trusts. Uh, uh, next, we're going to talk about dealing with the kids and the grandchildren and what, how those plans should, be, should work. Uh, in, in, in November, we're going to talk about Medicare, which is a kind of a standard. You really need to know about that as a senior. And finally, in December, we're going to talk about tax planning and giving uh, in December. So this month, uh, we're talking about Frank and Mary in their 80s and specifically dealing with frailty. Why are we talking about that now? Because chances are Frank and Mary are going to die in their 80s uh, if they're still alive. Um, that there, there are some people that live to 90 in their 90s, and that's great. And this seminar obviously is also about you. There were a few people, we have a good friend who is 102. This may be about you. But for, for most people in your 80s, you need to be talking about at least protecting yourself against what might happen if you become frail in those years, because that's when it's most likely uh, going to happen. So. Uh, we're talking about Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Uh, I always tell people if you're old enough to get the joke, you're old enough to be my client. Um, and their basic goal, which has always been to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. Um, and by the way, um, we have also introduced Mary's sister Peg and her daughter Peggy into all of this. So you get some understanding of what the issues are if you're a single person dealing with, with these questions. But by the way, if you're Peg and Peggy, if you're Peg, you're worrying about the same thing that Frank and Mary are worried about right now. So we're going to talk about that. So uh, in this case, we're assuming that Frank um, and Mary own their own home. We're going to talk about them in two different locations. So we're going to talk about them um, here um, in the Metro West area where I live, uh, where their home uh, probably has worth, is worth about $400,000 now. We're also going to talk about them if they're on the islands, because as many of you know, I go to both Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Uh, and on those islands, chances are that house, which is the same house, was probably a lot worth a lot closer to about a million dollars. Um, in, these, in both cases, Frank has an IRA worth 400000 They have joint savings of 300000 So in, and once again, for some folks, they're going to say, well, I don't have that much in assets. Well, all of the issues to you are going, all of the mass health related issues here are going to be the same if you have less than this amount of assets. The only significance of those numbers is we tried to keep it high enough to deal with folks who also have estate tax related issues. So Frank's income is $2,000 a month from Social Security. Mary's is half of his, $1,000 a month from Social Security. And they're all going to be fine. Um, because they've got Medicare and they've got some savings and they got their house and it's paid for unless Mary um, needs nursing home care or otherwise needs to qualify for MassHealth. 
And so that's what we're really going to be focusing on today is how do we plan to deal with that? Um, and how in that situation, if Mary fell down, had a stroke, whatever, and ended up in the hospital and appeared that she needed to be staying in a nursing home for a while, how she could qualify for Mass Health. And of course, that's going to be really important to Frank and Mary at that point, because um, if, they, if Mary doesn't qualify for Mass Health, first of all, her Medicare is only going to cover her for uh, about 100 days in the nursing home. Actually, that's the maximum period for which Medicare will cover. The median length of time that Medicare will cover people in a nursing home is about 17 days. Um, the reason for that is Medicare will stop coverage as soon as the nursing home determines, based on Medicare regulations, that Mary no longer needs um, daily um, um, nursing assistance. Uh, if, if that's the case, then as far as they're concerned, she doesn't need to be in a hospital which means she either needs to be discharged or she needs to be in a nursing home. But if she needs to be in a nursing home, Medicare will, will, will not pay because Medic for more than 100 days because at that point, even if Mary still needs those kinds of services, in, in, in Medicare's um, um, opinion at that point, um, she's going to be staying there. And Medicare is a health insurance program. It covers the cost of getting better, not the cost of staying the same. So at that point, Mary's going to be needing to pay privately for that nursing home care, which is going to cost somewhere between twelve and seventeen thousand dollars a month right now, um, which is just a whole lot of money, unless Mary qualifies for Mass Health, which means Mary has to be able to qualify for Mass Health. So that's the bad news. The good news is that in Frank and Mary's case, Mary could qualify fairly quickly for Mass Health. Why? To qualify for Mass Health, Mary has to show that she has assets of less than $2,000. But Frank, as the healthy spouse, can own the home no matter what the equity in the home. He can have other cash or cash equivalent assets equal to what right now is $148,600. And this is being taped in 2023. This number changes every year. Um, um, and by the way, uh, and, and, and he can have unlimited income. Uh, therefore, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, in the event that Mary needs to qualify for Mass Health, Frank needs to talk about purchasing an annuity. So, what is the strategy if Mary's in the nursing home? Ideally, before Mary's Medicaid benefit has stopped, and, and it, then Mary needs to take these steps to qualify. Incidentally, many times I'll have folks who are trying to qualify for mass or, or, who, or where, where Mary is still at home, but because Mary's health is really deteriorated, um, uh, she really needs to move to a nursing home, even though she's not stopping at a hospital first. If she goes to a hospital and is there for at least three days, then when she goes to the nursing home, she'll, be able, she'll probably be there on Medicare. If she goes directly from home, she's going to need to pay that first month of nursing home care privately. Which, which Mary and Frank need to factor into their planning to make sure that that money is available. So um, the, the basic strategy in Frank and Mary's case is that all assets need to get transferred to Frank. And, and this can be done at the last minute, contrary to the very, very common public or popular myth. There is no look back period. Everyone's heard of this look back period. There is no look back period regarding transfers between spouses. So Mary could at this point immediately transfer all the assets to Frank, which Frank could do on her behalf, which is important because at this point we're assuming Mary is incapacitated. Frank could do on her behalf as long as he has a power of attorney for Mary, or Mary's given him a power of attorney, that A, gives him as her attorney the right to make gifts, and B, gives him the right to make gifts to himself. Um, so all assets would get transferred to Frank. At that point, uh, I, we would advise Frank, keep, say, $100,000. Take the rest of the money and buy an annuity. Um, and and the, the reason why I'm, I'm mentioning this, right, and I'm going to talk about the annuity a little bit more uh, in a second, Frank keeps this amount because, as I had, had mentioned, his assets can't be above $148,600 in order for Mary to qualify for Mass Health. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, but that limit only applies up to the time that Mary has qualified. 
After that, Frank can have basically unlimited assets. He could hit the lottery the day after Mary qualifies for Mass Health and have much more in assets, uh, and it wouldn't make any difference to Mary's qualification. The point is that, is that, that Frank's assets have no limit after Mary has qualified. So what Frank would do at that point with that extra money, and he can do this at the last minute, once again, would be to buy a Medicaid qualifying annuity. What is that? It is an annuity that has these terms. It calls, for, it, it, it calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is less than Frank's actuarial life expectancy at that time. Remember, we, we indicated that um, Frank's life expectancy at age 80 would be about nine years, right? Um, if Frank dies before the end of that term and all of the payments on that annuity have not been ma made to him, then MassHealth will have a lien on the remaining payments regarding any payments that had been made on Mary's behalf, um, which is one of the reasons um, why uh, there is an incentive when Frank is looking to buy this annuity to buy a short annuity. The annuity, there is a limit on how long it can be. It can't be longer than Frank's actuarial life expectancy. It can be much shorter than that though. So, so that's one reason for making it a shorter annuity. The other reason is that the interest rate on these annuities is really terrible. Uh, the typical interest rate right now on these annuities is about 1%, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later on. Um, so th then some, now that's the basic formula as to what Frank needs to do. Now here's some of the issues that often comes up. First of all, what if there are tax deferred funds involved? And we talk about this a lot more, I talk a lot more about tax deferred funds uh, in seminar number two. Um, the seminar dealing with um, Frank and Mary in their 60s. But, but kind of two issues that are kind of specifically applicable here. In this case, um, Frank has these tax deferred funds, and as I've said, his strategy would be to take up to $100,000 of his total funds, use the rest to buy an annuity. Well, he ne Frank needs to know that in this case, if he uses those tax deferred funds to buy that annuity, that's okay, the purchase of the annuity is not in itself a taxable event. So he's not gonna have to pay a big, in take a big income tax hit regarding those funds when he turns it into an annuity. He's gonna end up having to take his payments earlier than he would otherwise have had to have done them because, because in the absence of this, if Frank wanted to, he could simply take his little required minimum distributions every year and minimize the tax, um, but at least it's good that those payments, the tax payments are going to be spread over nine years. He's not going to be pay, taking a big tax hit in one year because he's having to cash everything out. Now, by the way, that also really applies, or imagine the opposite case here were true and that Frank were in the nursing home. So that we were advising Mary, well, the only way you're going to qualify Frank for Mass Health is by taking all of his assets and transferring, the, transferring them to you. In that case, the only way to do that would be to cash out Frank's tax deferred funds, the $400,000, pay the tax on them, which would probably be $100,000, $125,000, transfer the rest of the money to Mary so that she could in turn keep say $100,000 and use the rest to buy an annuity. The reason why I bring this up is as a matter of, of, of planning on this issue, um, one of the things that I tell couples is you may, if you have a lot of tax deferred funds want us, and you're getting older, start taking out those funds over a number of years, not at that re just at that required minimum distribution rate, but at a higher rate. Um, as a result of that, you're certainly going to be paying tax on more of the money every year, but you're going to be paying tax at a much lower rate, at a much lower federal tax rate than you would be paying if all of a sudden, for, for mass health protection purposes, you need to shift out assets all of a sudden, okay? Finally, I'm gonna mention this, uh, this, um, th th this issue of the comparative interest rate. So certainly, um, there is an advantage to, to, to Mary to qualify for mass health and that she's going to have a nursing home cost that's gonna be, say, $15,000 a year, whereas once she's on mass health, all she's gonna to need to be paying the nursing home is going to be 1,000 a year, which was, is what her income is. So she's gonna be saving 14,000 a year, right? And that's, a, or excuse me, 14,000 a month, uh, which, which turns into uh, you know, over $150,000 a year. Um, 
but the but the but the downside of that the downside of that um, is that if you if me, Frank and Mary had significant income that they were earning whether on tax deferreds or on their regular investments that it, that income is going to go down substantially so, as I had mentioned the interest rate typically that people will get on a tax deferred um, annuity on one of these tax deferred annuities right now or excuse me, on one of these Medicaid qualifying annuities is about 1% a year. Well, uh, if Frank and Mary had $100,000, then they're, they're, they're probably earning right now about 4% a year on their money, right? The difference between that 4% and 1% is 3%. Well, 3% of $100,000 is $3,000. Say on the other hand that Frank and Mary had assets of a million dollars. And remember, as a matter of fact, in this case, Frank, Frank and Mary have assets of 800,000. If they had assets of a million dollars, then that lost revenue resulting from the fact that they had to buy this Medicaid qualifying annuity is $30,000 a year. It's really substantial. So it may be, I guess I, I mentioned this for two reasons. One, if Mary were, were in the nursing home thinking about qualifying for Mass Health, and it didn't appear that she was going to be living for very long, then it may very well be that if you've got tax deferred funds on which you have to pay taxes, and if you're going to be losing all of this income on this annuity and it's for a long period of time, it may not be worth it. It may not be worth it. Mary could definitely qualify for Mass Health, but there may be countervailing disadvantages that, that outweigh those advantages. S uh, similarly, um, because of this lost income resulting from the, the terrible rates that the annuities pay, it may very well be that, that Frank, in this case, would want to buy a much shorter annuity. Remember, he doesn't have to buy an annuity for nine years. It just has to be nine years or less. So it may be that Frank decides that he's only going to buy an annuity that's going to pay out all of his payments for in three or four years. And, and as a result of that, he'll be getting his money back faster and therefore be able to convert that money faster into regular investments of his. Because remember, once Mary has qualified for Mass Health, the day after she qualifies, Frank can get all of his money back any time. So there's a lot of thinking that really needs to be done when you're figuring out how to do this kind of restructuring. I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about some, a couple specific issues. First, the vacation home. Um, Everything that I've said, uh, think about everything that I've said and how it applies to the vacation home. So Mary goes into the nursing home. Say Frank and Mary have a house someplace, a little place on the Cape, someplace. Um, and, they, and now Mary needs to qualify for Mass Health. <clears throat> well, if that is a rental property, then Mass Health regulations say that just like the, 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 the home, Frank, as the healthy spouse, can keep the rental property. Um, and, and, any in, and, and any income that's derived from the rental property is just his, he's allowed to have unlimited income, right? So, but what if it isn't a rental property? If it isn't and it's simply an asset, then it's one of those assets that, of, um, that needs to be converted into cash and then the money used to purchase an annuity because the total, the maximum amount of his assets, it's only $148,600. So this is the one issue, the vacation home, that can, cause, that can cause real kind of angst to a family, especially if their goal was always to preserve this vacation home for their kids. Um, th th this happens a lot with properties that are on Martha's Vineyard or people around here uh, in, in, uh, in my, where, near where I live who have a place on the Cape. That may be the one property where, you, where as a long-term planning matter, Frank and Mary wanna cons may want to consider transferring the property out of their names to the kids or to an irrevocable trust and waiting five years. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, finally, um, as I mentioned, uh, the Medicaid qualifying annuity can be bought at the last minute. It has to be um, shorter than, than the, the life expectancy of the person who's applying. It can be much shorter, right? By the way, I just want to mention, if you're buying a, 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 a Medicaid qualifying annuity that's really short, say for a term of two years or less, you're probably gonna be needing to pay a premium to the insurance company in order to be able to buy it. You're basically, they're doing you a favor by allowing you to buy annuity that's so short, but it's probably gonna be worth that premium. Finally, Frank and Mary, what the, once Mary has, is on MassHealth, 
but in many cases, even before Mary is, is, is on Mass Health, Frank and Mary may want to decide on an asset protection plan that assures that when one of them dies, the other one would still be safe. Remember, all of this only works regarding Frank and Mary because they're both alive. So it may be that what Frank and Mary want to do, and this is a very common estate plan for, for folks in their 80s and for folks who are younger than that who are worried about these issues, is to have each uh, Frank and Mary have a will that has a testamentary trust in it that says as part of the will, any assets that were going to go to my spouse are instead going to go in trust for the benefit of my spouse. If the wills are structured that way and Frank dies owning all of these assets, they are immediately safe, non-countable and non-lienable for the benefit of Mary. So oftentimes I'll tell folks, especially if folks, are, if folks are both healthy, I'll say, well, what you may want to do to be on the safe side is have that kind of estate plan and though, with wills with testamentary trusts, not even fund them, not necessarily fund them and put assets in one person's name or another because you don't know who's going to be, who's going to be sick. If on the other hand, in a Frank and Mary case, Mary had already been having, say, cognitive issues and it looked like she might need nursing home care later on, what Frank may want to do in that case, or what they both may want to do in that case, is have wills with testamentary trusts, transfer the assets at that point to Frank, especially the home, which is the really valuable asset, so that if Frank dies suddenly, these assets will in instantly be safe, non-countable, and non-lienable in the event that Mary later needs to qualify for mass health. Um, a couple of other things. What if Mary's health has declined she really needs a lot of care, but she doesn't necessarily need nursing home care. She, just, she could actually, be, if she had enough care at home to help Frank out, she could actually stay home for the rest of her life. Well, there is another program, a mass health program called the Frail Elder Waiver, designed to do exactly that. The same um, uh, income and asset qualifications are, are, the, the, are the same that in order to, to qualify, um, the assets, Frank's assets have, Frank can own the house. Frank has to have other assets of less than $148,600. The only difference is that on Mary's side, in order for Mary to qualify uh, it, without having to pay a really substantial deductible, Mary would need to show that her income from pension and social security was less than $2,742 a year. That could, that could cause a problem. It, certainly in this case it doesn't because Mary's income is only $1,000 a year. Um, but if, if they qualified for that program, Mary, Mary could probably get mass health coverage for up to about 40 hours of care at home in order to avoid going to a nursing home. For more details on this though, you really want to talk to an elder law attorney. What about, what about Peg and Peggy, Mary's sister Peg? They basically are worried about the same things right now because, because Peg is 80. Um, and Peg would know, Mary's, you know, Pe Peggy is worried about it, Peg would know that if she needed to go to a nursing home, uh, if she were living around here, she'd have to spend down all of her cash, her cash equivalent assets to less than 2000 Then she could qualify even though she had the house because MassHealth would say, as long as you say you intend to return home, you can keep the house, but MassHealth would then put a lien on the house, right? If, if Peg lived on the islands though, even after she had spent down all of her money, if she had a house that was worth a million dollars, she may end up having a problem. Um, because the rules are that in order for her to qualify for mass health, she'd need to spend down her cash or cash equivalent assets to less than $2,000. If she says that she wants to stay home, then she can keep that home, except that right now there's a cap on home values of $1,003,000. If she exceeds that cap, then MassHealth's going to require that the home gets sold and that all the proceeds be used to pay down her nursing home care. Peg's only alternatives to qualify at that point are, one, get married really quickly. I always mention this, but my clients never do it. Or two, have made, done advanced planning, given, having given away her assets at least five years ago. This is the famous five-year look-back period. Uh, and then waited out those five years. In the case of Mary, uh, or in the case of Peg and Peggy, that's pretty easy because Mary could simply give away her ass all of her assets to Peg and Peggy. In the case of her house, for various reasons, she'd probably want to give away only a remainder interest in that house while keeping a life estate in the house. In the case of, of Mary, though, 
um, if Frank had died and Mary was now needing to qualify for Mass Health because she had all these assets, she would probably want to consider creating an irrevocable trust. That's the most common term that people always hear about and come into me wanting to talk about because they want to qualify for Mass Health in the long run. That's an irrevocable trust, a trust from which you cannot take things out once you've put them in. Typically, you would name one of the, trust, one of the children as the trustee, probably the one that you trust the most. The trust would say that during Mary's lifetime, these assets could be transferred by the trustee to any one of the kids who in turn would have the ability to give those assets back to Mary if she needed them, which is not a problem for tax purposes. There's this myth that there's some kind of a gift tax that affects any of this. There isn't, right? Um, and that trust would be a so-called grantor taxable trust so that the transfer of the house into the trust, while it would protect the house for mass health purposes, would still be grantor taxable for tax purposes so that if the house got sold, uh, Mary could still take advantage of her capital gains exclusion. When Mary died, the so-called tax basis of the house would still jump to the date of death value. So there are a lot of reasons why Mary want to consider, may want to consider doing an irrevocable trust in that case, but only in that case, only if you're single and you're doing this kind of planning, do you need to transfer your assets out of your name and wait five years. I hope this presentation has been helpful. I know it's an, these are extremely important issues to people in their 80s who are trying to sleep well at night. If you've got any questions on this, please give me a call anytime. Um, my my uh, direct line is 508-860-1470. Hope you enjoyed the presentation, and I hope to see you next month. Thank you.